Welcome to Premise Podcast. This is your host, Angelo Sofocleus. In this episode, I have the pleasure of hosting Professor Peter Singer. Professor Singer gives an introduction to the theory of utilitarianism, the main arguments for it, and what major utilitarianists such as Bentham, Mill, Sedgwick, and Singer himself have contributed to the theory. Professor Singer also gives an overview of different types of utilitarianism and explains how utilitarianism is linked to his own work on animal ethics. Welcome everyone to this episode of Premise Podcast. Today I have the pleasure and honor to have Professor Peter Singer with me. Professor Singer, welcome to Premise Podcast. Thank you. It's good to be with you. It's a pleasure. So, Professor Singer, is, uh, you're a professor at bioethics at Princeton University and a uh, laureate professor at the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the University of Melbourne. Uh, you've been described as the world's most influential living philosopher. Uh, and your 1975 book, Animal Liberation, is said to have uh, started the modern animal rights movement. Also, you are the founder of The Life You Can Save, an organization which aims to spread your ideas about why we should be doing uh, much more to improve the lives of people uh, living in extreme poverty and how we can best do this. And of course, you are one of the uh, or perhaps the biggest proponent of uh, utilitarianism today. And that's the way I first came to know about your work in the first year of my philosophy degree. So starting with the basics, how can we define utilitarianism? Uh, utilitarianism is the view that the right action is the one that will have the best consequences and uh, utilitarians distinguish themselves from others who take that view by saying that the significant consequences, the uh, intrinsic or ultimate goods, are those to do with happiness and the reduction of suffering, or sometimes it's put in terms of uh, improving well-being or welfare. So mm -hmm. you could say that uh, utilitarians are uh, welfare-focused consequentialists. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned um, welfare, and there's also the notion of maximizing happiness and pleasure within utilitarianism. Uh, but is this easily defined in utilitarianism and in your work? How can we define pleasure um, or happiness? There are several different accounts of, of welfare or well-being. Um, you mentioned pleasure, and that's the classical account uh, of utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, Henry Sidgwick, uh, were hedonistic utilitarians. That is, they did talk about pleasure uh, and the absence of pain or suffering. The most careful account of what that is comes from uh, Henry Sidgwick, who's less well known than either Bentham or John Stuart Mill, but was a much more careful philosopher. Sidgwick wrote uh, in the last qu quarter of the 19th century. Um, and his, his main book is called The Methods of Ethics. Uh, he uh, regards pleasure as a desirable state of consciousness. So it's a, it's a state of consciousness or a state of mind that we're talking about. Um, his definition of exactly, you know, how what we mean by a desirable state of consciousness is um, a little tricky, but essentially, you know, he starts off with the idea that it's a state of consciousness that other things being equal, we would want to continue or that we want to continue for its own sake or we would want to have if we don't have it. Um, he also says it's something like a, a state that we immediately apprehend as desirable. So as if there's a kind of a judgment that when you experience pleasure, you think, yes, this is a, this is a desirable state to be in. Uh, and conversely, pain or suffering is an undesirable state, a state that you want to end if you could, other things being equal. 
Uh, so that's the, I think, the, the best classical account, and I still think it's a very plausible account that uh, uh, happiness consists in um, maximizing maximizing these states of desirable consciousness and minimizing the states of undesirable consciousness. Um, but as I say, there are other theories of well-being that count as utilitarian, uh, including the idea that well-being consists in the satisfaction of one's desires or preferences, even if that doesn't maximize one's states of desirable states of consciousness. It could be somewhat different things. Um, so that's another account. There are some also some philosophers who think that there's, you can have an, a kind of objective list of things that are intrinsically good. Um, so some people who are influenced by Aristotle think of uh, perfecting your nature as uh, objectively good and as a high st high state of well-being. So there are there is there are, there are different theories, but um, as I say, the the classical view and the one that I've uh, come to adopt, though I didn't always hold it, um, is the the hedonistic view. Mm -hmm. So I know you were in the past a preference utilitarianist, and now you hold the uh, hedonistic view. And uh, would you support that? Um, as you said, we we have a a rational capacity of recognizing which pleasures to follow and which harmful things to avoid. Would you say that we intrinsically follow pleasure and avoid harm? in a similar sense that Mill talked about higher and lower pleasures that we intrinsically um, consider some things to be more pleasurable than others? No, I don't think we um, necessarily make the right judgments in this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you, you asked, uh, I guess, really two different questions. One is whether we intrinsically pursue pleasure uh, and the other is whether we make the distinction that Mill talked about between higher and lower pleasures. Yes. Uh, and, and I think I would say no to both of those. That is, um, you know, yes, maybe we, we have a tendency to pursue pleasure. I'm not denying that. But I don't think that uh, necessarily everything that we pursue, we pursue for the sake of pleasure. In other words, I'm not uh, a psychological hedonist. Psychological hedonism is the view that uh, we are always motivated by the desire for pleasure and to avoid pain. Uh, and perhaps uh, Bentham, uh, possibly Mill, um, were psychological hedonists, but Sidgwick was not. Um, he clearly distinguished psychological hedonism from from ethical hedonism, uh, the view that it's that, that pleasure is good. Uh, and I, I think it's clear that for all sorts of reasons, some people do not pursue pleasure. Some people, some, they may be misguided by other ideas or other ideals, um, but I don't think we always pursue it. Um, secondly, to go to Mill's distinction between higher and lower pleasures, I think Mill was, Mills did not present a good argument in favor of, of higher pleasures. He tried to, he tried to draw this distinction, I think, to avoid the objection that utilitarianism is a, a philosophy fit for swine. That is, you know, pigs pursue pleasure. They roll in the mud or they eat or whatever. But um, but humans have to somehow be, to aim at something higher, aim, aim at something maybe more like philosophy. And Mill used the example of Socrates. Uh, and, you, you know, you, you could argue that we should aim at something higher, but I think you're not doing that then in terms of saying that this is a greater pleasure. You're doing it in terms of saying there are other values, not pleasure. Yeah that ought to be taken into account. And then you're, you're, not, uh, uh, you're not a hedonist or you're not only a hedonist. So uh, I don't think Mill can really draw that distinction consistently with hedonism. Uh, and I don't think his argument that, uh, you know, Socrates dissatisfied is better than a fool satisfied uh, and only Socrates, only somebody who's experienced both the pleasures of philosophy and the pleasures of the fool or the pig uh, can really judge between them. Um, it's quite possible that you know, people who go on to philosophy do find that enjoyable, but maybe that's the kind of person they are um, and they get pleasure from it. Um, whereas a lot of other people don't get any pleasure from it. So mm -hmm. I, I don't find Mill's argument here persuasive. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Mill's argument or Mill's statement that he would prefer to be Socrates dissatisfied than a 
the full or uh, sometimes I mentioned as a P satisfied. What what do you make of this argument? In because in my understanding, by saying that one would prefer to be Socrates dissatisfied, uh, they're not talking about whether they would be um, they would prefer to be to be less happy than uh, th than they would be in other circumstances, for example, by being a fool, but that by being Socrates, they have some attributes or personality characteristics that a P, for example, doesn't have, such as to enjoy poetry or to gain pleasure by looking at art or play games or uh, things that are mostly characteristic of, of being a human. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, maybe we should say characteristic of being some humans. I don't know that all humans uh, enjoy uh, poetry or philosophy or art, or at least I don't know that they all enjoy them as much as they enjoy simpler, more basic pleasures. Yeah. Um, at least so, they have capacity of they have the capacity of enjoying that, even if they they don't. Maybe uh, I don't. I'm not sure that we really know that. I'm not sure that we know that everybody has that capacity. Maybe that some people just can't get that much enjoyment from it as, as others. Um, you know, just as um, some people have greater capacity to enjoy classical music. Um, I'm somebody who doesn't have a good ear for classical music and therefore I can't really enjoy classical music in the way that I know many of my friends can. Uh, so, you know, that doesn't, doesn't really trouble me. There's many other things that I enjoy. Um, but uh, I, I don't assume that everybody has the same capacities to enjoy classical music. Um, and I suppose the same could well be true of poetry or philosophy or, or, or art. Mm -hmm. And going back to the theory of utilitarianism, one of its main points is that we shouldn't uh, differentiate between uh, different people when we come to take a decision. For example, uh, if uh, someone is a a stranger to us or a relative to us, then we should treat them in uh, in the same manner when uh, when adding pleasure and harm in the hedonistic calculus. Um, do you do you hold this view that we should treat everyone in the same way? And do you think that it's uh, it's a plausible view to hold that it doesn't go against our nature to favor strangers over our family members? So I think we, we need to um, distinguish perhaps what's the ultimate intrinsic goods of <coughs> strangers and relatives and how to weigh them up and the question of uh, equal treatment which might be a, a separate matter. So certainly I think the utilitarian view is clear that um, the well-being of a complete stranger matters just as much as my own well-being or the well-being of members of my family or friends. Um, assuming that, uh, this goes back to what we were just talking about, assuming that the capacities for enjoyment, happiness and misery are similar. So, you know, if, for example, there's someone who's in a coma and will never recover from the coma, uh, obviously they have no capacity for enjoying their life. And so they don't count uh, as much as my own capacity. Um, but uh, if we assume capacities are similar, then uh, ultimately it's just as important that a stranger is, is happy or doesn't suffer as it is that someone is close to me. Does that mean that I should treat the stranger just the same as I should treat someone close to me? Well, not necessarily. There are, there are some differences that we can take into account. Um, I can have a much better knowledge of what will improve the well-being of uh, somebody very close to me than I can of a stranger. Um, I can have greater certainty that something that I do will make a difference to that person. Um, and also, of course, being close to people makes a difference to me, so I can take account of my the impact on uh, my own well-being here. Um, but uh, you know, these are relatively smaller differences than on many ethical views, which 
sort of suggest that you have very stringent duties to those who are close to you or part of your family and either no duties at all or very weak duties to those who are um, further away from you. So uh, I think that the utilitarian view is is stronger in terms of getting us to give consideration to uh, people far from us. And, and by the way, when we're talking about people far from us, it's not just strangers uh, like who are socially distant and it's not just people who are geographically far from us like people in a country on the other side of the world. It's also people who are distant from us in, in time. And, and this is something that is important today in the context of climate change where we don't give nearly enough weight to the impact that our emissions of greenhouse gases today will have on people in uh, 50 years or 100 years or even further down the track. So um, I think the utilitarianism takes the right view on all of these questions uh, in saying that we ought to be giving, uh, at some fundamental level, we ought to be giving equal weight to the interests of people far from us, uh, even if in practice there may be reasons for giving somewhat less weight to their interests. Mm -hmm. And I would like to touch on another point on utilitarianism. In I'll give two scenarios in which utilitarianism seems to be the right approach to take. For example, when someone uh, steals some bread to feed their family, or um, if I get on the bus and I have no money, but I really need to get somewhere and uh, the bus driver just um, lets me on with uh, without paying. And in those instances, we might say that their their action was good because it created more pleasure, uh, minimal harm, and in general, it created more pleasure in, in the world. Um, however, I think there would be a problem if such cases are not just some single cases that happened once, but they are treated as, as a rule. Um, that is, many people getting on the bus without paying or uh, many people stealing bread to feed their family. If we treat these as single cases, their utilitarianism is the right approach. But how would utilitarianism uh, deal with such cases becoming problematic in a large scale? Well, utilitarians are always concerned with consequences. So clearly they will take account of the risk that uh, doing something on one occasion might lead to it happening on more occasions. And while the consequences of it happening on one occasion are good, the consequences of it happening on many occasions could be bad. Uh, so uh, there, there, there would be different situations. Um, you know, one could argue that sometimes it's, it's right to do good but not to be public about it just so that it doesn't spread. So the, the kind of case that you mentioned about the, the bus driver who happens to know some p passenger uh, who's uh, left his wallet at home but really needs to get to work and um, so he can be sure that this is actually a, a true story and something that uh, isn't going to keep happening, um, might let the passenger ride, but um, perhaps would try to keep that quiet so that other people don't get the idea that, oh, if I get on the bus and tell the driver a, a sad story, um, I won't have to pay my fare. Uh, and, and that may be one way in which you can have the good consequences without having the bad consequences. Um, but there may be other situations where you can't do that where it is sort of obviously public what's happening um, and then I think utilitarians may sometimes have to make the difficult choice of saying even though in the short term this would do good um, in the long term it will do harm because it will lead to a breakdown of um, whatever institution we're talking about and uh, that will have worse consequences in the long run. Mm -hmm. And coming towards the end of the podcast and since you've done an immense amount of work in uh, animal ethics and uh, as I said in the beginning your your book Animal Liberation uh, I said to have started the, the modern 
animal rights movement. Um, how do you think your theory of utilitarianism and your theory of animal ethics uh, go together and what can one contribute to the other? Well, um, you know, animal ethics is one of the things that utilitarians have always been ahead of their times when speaking about it goes back very clearly to Jeremy Bentham, uh, who has this remarkable footnote in his introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, uh, which he wrote just after the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, and he says that just as the French have discovered that the color of a person's skin is no reason to abandon him to a tormentor, um, he was thinking about the fact that the French revolutionaries uh, abolish slavery in the French colonies. Um, so too, he says, the day may come when we recognize that animals also have rights. Uh, and that was just you know, so far ahead of his time. There were no laws uh, in England or really anywhere in the world to protect animals from cruelty at that time. Uh, and then John Stuart Mill also strongly spoke up about uh, the importance of protecting animals. Uh, and Sedgwick also is clear on this. Uh, so I think it uh, fits very well. Um, it fits very well because utilitarians are concerned about pain and suffering and uh, and pleasure and happiness. Uh, they're not so concerned as, for example, Kantians have been about whether you're a self-conscious or autonomous being. Um, you know, these things will matter in some circumstances, but they're not the bedrock of ethics for utilitarians in the way that they are for Kant. Um, so naturally, utilitarians want to reduce pain and suffering, whether it's inflicted on animals or on humans. Uh, and the question is only, uh, well, well, I shouldn't say only, it's quite the difficult question is to say, so which animals are capable of suffering? How much do they suffer? Under what circumstances do they suffer? Uh, and what are the, what are the trade-offs here between um, our suffering and theirs, which inevitably will occur in some situations? Uh, so, so there are a host of difficult empirical questions and, and then they're, they're not straightforwardly empirical questions because they depend on trying to understand what's going on in the, in the consciousness of another being. Um, but I think they're questions that inevitably, uh, you know, we have to, we have to grapple with. Uh, I think we can't just say, well, we don't know how much animals suffer, so we're not going to count their suffering at all. I think that would clearly be wrong. So, uh, those are questions that any ethical person needs to tackle. Mm -hmm. And even if we discover that for some reason uh, animals don't feel pain or they don't suffer, um, I would still say that it's wrong to uh, to kill them. So um, I'm uncertain about the fact that animals feel pain is the primary reason uh, that we shouldn't kill animals. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I think you you know. The, the view that I hold certainly does require that animals are capable of uh, conscious states that you know, that, are, that are good or bad for them uh, if they were not conscious at all. Um, so not only that they don't feel, let's say, physical pain, but they also don't feel any pleasure or any kind of positive states, then I don't think there'd be any difference between uh, killing a cow or a pig and, and, and killing a, a cabbage. Um, and I don't feel that there is any reason why we shouldn't kill a cabbage if uh, you know, we need to eat. So um, I do think it, the, the, the case for the animal movement that I make relies on the idea that they are conscious beings whose lives can go well or badly for them because of their internal experiences. Mm -hmm. So Professor Singer, I would really like to thank you for your participation in the podcast. You're very welcome. It's been uh, it's been good to talk to you. Yeah, it's been a and, pleasure. And to your listeners. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Lot. Good. Bye then. You have just listened to Premise Podcast. Subscribe to Premise Podcast on YouTube and make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter and Facebook. The podcast is also available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Please consider supporting Premise Podcast on Patreon to help bring philosophy to the public. See you next week. Thanks for listening.